Okay. Uh, Kalior, what do you think of this case? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> sagittal image on the left, we see flat foot deformity. Um, the posterior tibialis tendon, the images on the right is thickened with some Maltinus and avitis, so maybe some moderate tendinosis. Right. And the rule of thumb is that <clears throat> it shouldn't even be no larger than the sum of the cross-sectional areas of the two other tendons here. So this is definitely large. The capsule is probably a little bit thickened. There's fluid around it. So this is posterior tibialis tendinopathy. And this is associated flat foot deformity. You get when the posterior tibialis tendon is no longer functional, not working properly, and you don't get proper support of the arch of the ankle. <laughs> okay, Robert, what do you think of this case? Uh, here, let's see, it looks like there's some hind foot valgus there. Right. Okay, and if we draw an angle between the long axis of the tibia and the axis of the calcaneus, <laughs> this is called the alpha angle, like every other angle in radiology. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have greater than six degrees, that's heel valgus. And, uh, and then you can see here where it stops by impacting against the lateral malleolus, which is, as we'll see later when we talk about impingement syndrome, is lateral bony impingement of the ankle. Okay. And it's, again, this is highly associated with posterior tibialis tendinopathy. So that posterior tibialis tendon is an important uh, structure within the ankle, and uh, we'll get some other names for this. The more long standing name for this is called adult acquired flat foot deformity, which some people are trying to use other names now. We'll okay. talk about so the concept here is first you get posterior tibialis disease, it no longer becomes functional, you then get a strain on the table navicular joint. And then you start getting lost of the three arches as you strain the ligaments of the of the arches. Uh, now, in the early stages, it can be flexible, uh, which some people will call uh, plano valgus deformity. Uh, as time goes along, it becomes rigid, uh, which is much more difficult to treat. So you like to pick it up early. Now, the arches of the foot that people talk about are the longitudinal arch, uh, kind of in the midline. Uh, the uh, excuse me, the short axis arch, and then the longitudinal arch on the lateral aspect, including the fifth metacarpal. And uh, now, in uh, adult acquired flat foot deformity, uh, this would be the normal here. This is the abnormal over there. Uh, uh, what you start getting is a uh, not only valgus angulation of the calcaneus, but over time, you, so what you start getting is a lateral deviation of the navicular with respect to the talus. Uh, here we can see that if you draw a line through the distal end of the talus, through the mid portion of the navicular, and into the medial cuneiform, that's a nice straight line. Uh, now, what happens then when you start getting valgus angulation of the navicular with respect to the talus, if you draw a straight line through the talus, it's going to go off into no man's land here on the medial side, and this is called hind, hind foot valgus. Uh, now, if you actually look at the gait mechanism, <clears throat> uh, uh, it goes through a number of phases. There's a heel strike phase, there's the midfoot stance, there's a terminal stance, then your propulsion uh, with heel rise, then you have toe off the ground, the swing phase, and then you start with the next heel strike. So that's the that kind of what you go through. It turns out the stance stage where you're actually standing on a foot is about 60% of this. The swing stage is about 40%. And the mid stance is where we start getting a lot of our pathology. So uh, as far as abnormalities, there's the spring ligament. Uh, which, especially the superior medial bundle, uh, which goes underneath the posterior tibialis tendon. And when you have injury to the spring ligament, you stop supporting the, the central arch. MRI shows thinning, or th either thinning or thickening. 
uh, if torn, the PTT is uh, becomes adjacent to the talus on the coronal images. So if you have a tear, the again the superior medial bundle of the spring ligament, there are three components that we talked about, uh, goes between the PTT and the talus. <clears throat> Then there's the sinus tarsi, and we talked about the ligaments of the sinus tarsi, which when torn can lead to instability and uh, uh, sinus tarsi syndrome. There's a deltoid ligament, which is also talked about. The superficial components of the deltoid rather than the deep are really support structures along with the superior medial bundle. And then we have the plantar fascia that we've talked a lot about. So if we go into the spring ligament complex, <laughs> Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, aspects of the spring ligament. So now we're looking at the base of the foot, <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, peroneus longus. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not the the spring ligament comes across here. We've got the three components that we talked about before, and this is the posterior tibialis tendon attaches to the medial margin of the navicular, but as we talked about before, it goes distally and attaches, has multiple different uh, variable attachments to the different bones more distally within the foot. So the deltoid ligament, we've got the deep component, which goes between the medial malleolus and the medial margin of the talus, and then we have the superficial components uh, out here. And if you kind of look at the arch, uh, like a uh, like the roof structure of a roof, you typically have a nice normal arch here, and the plantar fascia, as you can see here, uh, stabilizes the base of this plantar arch. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the other things, whoops, you know, you also have the other tendons here, which are important, uh, but we'll get into that. And the, this is a a longitudinal component of the spring ligament down there. So one of the clinical findings you see are too many toe sign. This is normal. This is abnormal. So you see this when basically the distal part of the foot rotates laterally with respect to the, to the talus. So this is really hind foot valgus deformity, which leads the front of the foot to be too lateral. So looking from behind, you see the too many toe sign. Now, uh, and this is... Uh, so a qu uh, adult acquired flat foot deformity has four different stages that some people talk about. First, you get stage one swelling and tenderness along the PTT. You have no deformity, and the treatment for this is conservative treatment to allow this injury to the posterior tibialis to heal and not keep straining it and stretching it. Stage two, you get a flexible deformity of the heel uh, where you get heel valgus, where you start getting... Uh, uh, lateral angulation of the uh, of the uh, calcaneus. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and this is treated either by orth orthotics, usually uh, less likely surgery. Stage three is when it is no longer flexible but comes rigid, uh, where you have heel valgus deformity, uh, and then you're starting to get hind foot impingement where the lateral Calcaneus impinges upon the lateral malleolus that we talked about before. Uh, these are the injuries involved, a, a lot more than just the PTT, and this is typically a surgical condition. And then stage four is involvement of the tibial tailor uh, joint, uh, and you get an incompetent deep deltoid at this level, which is also a surgical condition. So this is a classic adult-acquired flat foot deformity. And you'll see a lot of it if you do much uh, foot imaging in your practices. Uh, <clears throat> some people now like to call this uh, progressive collapsing foot deformity. Uh, and uh, so far, I haven't been pressed to have to use this, but this is one of the newer words. And then stage one and two, stage one is flexible, which is less severe. Stage two is rigid. And then they, they have classes A through E. Uh, where you get hind foot valgus uh, with increased moment arm. Uh, then you, you start getting the midfoot forefoot abduction, uh, basically uh, hind foot valgus, and then you get fourth, um, and you go through the progressively through the different stages until you finally get uh, valgus tilting of the ankle and marked ankle instability. 
So in looking at this, I'm going to go back to the old uh, term uh, delta quadrant flat foot deformity. <clears throat> and there is a number of different angles that you can measure, primarily with plane films to help make this diagnosis. One's a Miri's angle, calcaneal pitch angle, cuneiform to fit metatarsal height, Taylor's tilt angle, and the uh, Taylor navicular and coverage angle, and incongruency angle. So I'm sure all of you have those down to memory. <laughs> Most of these I've, I've never used in a report. Now, Miri's angle is one that, that you will hear. Uh, and this is a, this is the angle between uh, the long axis of the talus on the uh, x-rays and the long axis of the first metatarsal bone. So this is uh, Miri's angle A, and it's abnormal if it's greater than 10 degrees. A number I don't remember. If I ever do need it, I go back and look at my copy of my lectures and pull it out. But you can just Google it. And, and get it. So that's Mary's angle. And it's what that basically shows is that the, the talus is pointing downward. Oops, let me go back here. Uh, this means that the talus is starting to go downward, which is you're starting to get early uh, uh, pest planus uh, with respect to the first metatarsal. So that's a way of kind of quantitating uh, uh, pest planus. Okay, now B is called uh, uh, calcaneal pitch angle, uh, which you can see measured here. Here's the horizontal line, and that's between the, the base of the heel and the inferior surface of the distal calcaneus, uh, and that's abnormality if it's less than 19 degrees. Again, this is another measurement of uh, pest planus where the whole midfoot of the foot is starting to drop down here. You're losing this arch, and therefore the, this angle uh, flattens. Then there's a cuneiform to fifth metatarsal height, uh, which is C here, uh, which is uh, distant from the base of the fifth metatarsal, and the inferior surface of the medial cuneiform. Again, this is, now this has a lot to do with the transverse arch where it starts to collapse. Abnormal is less than six degrees. And then there is a Taylor tilt angle, which uh, uh, is a, occasionally I've included in our report, but not very often. Uh, we basically take uh, the uh, uh, line going along the inferior aspect of the tibial plafond and another line superior aspect of the uh, uh, Taylor dome, and these these should be within this this angle should be less than five degrees. They really should be parallel to one another, but you'll find out as you get severe adult acquired flat foot deformity, what you'll do is start getting wearing on one side of the talus, and this angle will become increased. And then there's a talus navicular uncoverage angle, which is a way to try to measure the hind foot uh, 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 valgus, where you get abnormal orientation of the distal talus with respect to the navicular bone. And... Uh, uh, so this is A, and this is greater than 26. And then there's the incongruency angle, which is B, uh, involving the uh, the uh, lateral side of the navicular here. Now, I'm not spending a whole lot of time on these because they're really not used very much anymore. Um, so uh, Miri's angle and calcaneal pitch angle, which is flat foot deformity or pest planus, Correlates very well with posterior tibialis tendon tears. Uh, calcaneal pitch also correlates with other supporting structural injuries, such as the spring ligament, the deltoid, and the sinus tarsi ligaments. Okay. I don't know who's next. You? Okay. All right. So... Looks like we have a lot of uh, bony changes of the lateral uh, talus and posterior uh, the posterior tibiofibular uh, ligament is in this thing. That back here, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And then we've got the, the medial ligaments over here. Um, 
And then here we can see here the flexor tendons. I don't know what this is about, to be honest with you. Let me try and have it. Oh, flexor tendon twins there. I'm sorry. Okay, go back here. Uh, right. This is the posterior tibialis tendon. Then there's a uh, flexor digitorum longus, but there's no uh, flexor helm. Flex, uh, like flexor halicus longus. There's no a flexor digitorum longus. And if you look down here, we can see the flexor tendons. And then we we start as we go proximally, uh, we can see the flexor halicus longus tendon, but we don't see the flexor digitorum down here. And this is the area where you have that crossover. Uh, where you can actually get uh, uh, some jogger's foot symptoms, and we only see one tendon, and this is a tear, tear of the flexor digitorum. Sorry. Okay. James? I think I'm next uh, here. I, I, I think Oleg is next. Sorry, oh. I should have said something. Uh, so I see um, there's a high signal on the like plantar uh, there's plantar flexor tendon digitorum flantar halitis longus tendon. Okay, good. So there should should be a f th th these are probably portions of it. were distal the distal first metatarsal head. So these are probably the the medial and lateral lateral uh, sesamoid phalangeal ligaments. And you should have a, a flexor halicus longus tendon in the middle, and there's not one there. Mm -hmm. And if you go back uh, posteriorly, we can start seeing that uh, here's the brevis over here, but there, there's no longus here. If we keep going back, we're starting to get the area. Here's where we have the digitorum, the longus crossing over each other. And this was a distal flexor halicus longus tendon rupture with retraction. Okay, Elior. Okay, so here we have a skin marker overlying the navicular. Uh, I see, I mean, degenerative change of that dorsal tail and navicular joint. So we see that too, and then this is hard just on these images. Uh, but we see this little structure here. Okay. It stops. And then we see this little structure up here. Ah. Stops. Yes. Is that the flexor halicis longus? It's right. torn. So this is a more proximal tear. And if we look distally, we can see a very tendonotic distal flexor halicis longus. Again, this is flexor digitorum uh, in the crossover area. And uh, this, and here's the proximal component uh, retracted proximally, and this was a proximal flexor helicus longus tendon tear. Okay. And then uh, I'll just point this out. So here we have proximally the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor helicus longus, uh, more uh, the posterior tibialis, they were the three tendons. We go a little bit more uh, distally. So at this point, <laughs> the digitorum is medial, the halicus longus is lateral. And then there's an area here where they cross over. And then the flexor halicus longus distal to this is going to be medial. The flexor digitorum is going to be lateral where it should be. In this case, we're seeing a lot of fluid right in this location. And then here we see distally the two tendons. Uh, and this is called uh, intersection syndrome, the foot intersection syndrome. Uh, and the clinical sim symptoms of pain in this location is typically called jogger's foot. Robert, what do you think of this case? We have left diffuse plantar foot pain, and looks like there's a lot of fluid at that master knot of Henry, so I'd be concerned about an intersection syndrome here as well. Right. And here it is on the other side where we don't see the fluid in that area. And this is the asymptomatic side. This is the symptomatic side. And then that's the foot tendon intersection syndrome, or jogger's foot. Okay, Tyson. Uh, 
All right, so there's a couple low signal bodies there. Uh, was that like a monotonous junction of his uh, flexors? Not yeah, sure. I'm thinking show other images, but here, here we're at the calcaneus. We're posteriorly here, it's close to the midline. This is in the area of flexor helicus longus, and this is center of chondromatosis, not the mm -hmm. flexor helicus longus. Go look. Um, it's, uh, um, it's kind of like, uh, uh, the, the, the systemoid bones on the, under the hallux, uh, the proximal hallux. And sorry, there is a, uh, what is it? Um, there is a, a flexor digitorum tendon. Close, close. Uh, sorry, close. Flexus, flexus halus is longest tendon. Right. Flexus, flexus halus is longest tendon. Like, uh, right. she's supposed to go be between the, the sesamoid bones. Okay. And now... Uh, and then if we go to the coronal images, we can see it here with some fluid around it. Mm -hmm. And this was tenocentivitis of the flexor halicus longus right. tendon. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Elior? Okay, so 48-year-old, two-month status post-surgery for flexor halysis longus dysfunction, now with foot numbness. Um, I see, I think it's, I think it's the nerve that's, that looks a little large there. Yeah, the posterior tibialis nerve. Um I mean, was this in injured during surgery, maybe, or? Yeah. Okay, and then here we can see some more images here. Uh, the tibial nerve, at this point, it's absent. So here it's absent. If we uh, go back here, it's thickened. Uh, more, more approximately, it's thickened. And a little bit of dematis, if we go more distally, it should be right in here, and it's not there. It's absent. If we go to sagittal images, uh, we can see this is the end of that thickened tendon uh, right in through here. And if you go distally, you can see, pick up the distal tendon here, and there's no, I mean, nerve here, and there is no nerve in between the two. And this was a transection of the tibial nerve. Wow. With retraction and the bulbous end down here, which you typically get after a transection. Okay. All right, now uh, let's go to the flexor halicus longus sesamoid complex, uh, <clears throat> where the first metatarsophalangeal joint. And uh, what you can see here, here's a sesamoid, <clears throat> the uh, base of the first uh, uh, phalanx, uh, and then the and then the. Uh, 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 just the first metatarsal. And well, wherever you have uh, bones which kind of rub against one another, the body normally has uh, articular cartilage, which we can see here and here. Uh, and then here, uh, <clears throat> you know, you know, basically, I'm not in this the trabecular bone. <clears throat> so if we <clears throat> kind of look at this, <clears throat> uh, here's the first metacarpophalangeal joints. Here's the uh, sesamoid phalangeal joint, there's a medial one and a lateral one on the other side. Flexor halicus longus goes in between the two of those. Uh, and then we have the sesamoid uh, metatarsal uh, ligaments on either side, medial and lateral. If we go to the coronal images, here we can see the flexor halicus longus tendon. There's the inner sesamoidal ligament between the medial and lateral sesamoids, or, uh, you know, radial and uh, and, tib and tibial sesamoids, and then here are the collateral ligaments coming over here. And that's the extensor halicus longus tendon, and then uh, here laterally and uh, deep to the extensor halicus longus is the brevis. And if we look here, uh, this is a very important joint. There are a bunch of muscles that are attached to it. 
to allow adequate control of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. The big toe is very important for balance and for uh, pushing off and the power for running and going after and killing game back in the in the early days of humankind. So uh, it's, it's, it's developed for a very specific function. And so we, we just see the different uh, muscles uh, that help uh, uh, control it. Going to look at it uh, from gross specimen. We can see the metatarsal head, and this is the articular surface of the base of the uh, phalanx, and then the sesamoid bones down here. If we go to high uh, resolution imaging with uh, MR, uh, and you can see the articular cartilage and the bone, uh, and the, the fat, and then here are the tendons coming off here. And in the coronal plane, we can see the lateral and medial sesamoids, the articular cartilage. Here is some defect in the articular cartilage. Uh, as you know, these are very common locations for degenerative joint disease where you lose the articular cartilage and start getting the typical subchondral cysts and degenerative disease. And a sesamoid ligament, the flexor halicus longus, and then the collateral ligaments on either side. And over here, the abductor halicus. Uh, so that kind of gets us to turf toe. Basically, turf toe is an injury to one or more of these structures uh, primarily involving the plantar aspect of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint space. It classically divide turf toe because in the <clears throat> days when uh, we first started having uh, football stadiums with roofs on them, especially in, in Houston with the Astrodome, uh, you couldn't grow uh, grass on the field, so they had artificial turf, and it turned out that this was much more traumatic to feet than standard uh, ground turf. And so there started to be a lot of injuries that we really didn't see very much before the advent of artificial turf. And these often involve traumatic injuries uh, to this toe, since it's so important for power and running. And it has to do with either tears of any of these ligaments, like the intercessomoid, the uh, phalangeal sesamoid ligaments, uh, tear of the flexor longitudinal, I mean the flexor halicus uh, longus tendon, or even strains of the muscles involved here, as well as traumatic injuries and trabecular bone injuries of the bones here. Any of those can be involved in pain in this area after trauma from uh, turf and, and turf toe. So you need to look at the uh, 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 collateral ligament insertions, the uh, uh, brevis muscle insertions here on the sesamoid bones on each side, the longitudinal, uh, the flexor helicus longus, and the inner sesamoid ligaments all can be involved in turf toe, as well as contusions to the overlying uh, skin and subchondral, uh, subcutaneous fat. <clears throat> and here we can see some muscle strains and this college football player uh, uh, here you can see a lot of edema within the uh, uh, brevis muscle and uh, uh, an injury to the uh, phalangeal sesamoid ligament over here. And then here you can see the tear of that uh, phalangeal sesamoid ligament on the medial side and edema within the uh, medial sesamoid. And there's the tear of the uh, brevis coming in, and, the, and this also included the sesamoid phalangeal ligament as well. And in this case, we also had a tear of the flexor halicus longus tendon. So that's uh, kind of a, a lot of the findings that you can see in turf toe. And then here are some other kind of high resolution images where we can see a tear of that. Uh, sesamoid phalangeal ligament in uh, this patient. Again, I tear that ligament. Okay. 
And of course, I don't remember who was last. No, we are. I'm sorry, not uh, Oleg. Why don't you take this case? Um, it's like a ganglion. Uh, you know. Okay, so we see a cyst here, right? This, yeah. Looks like fluid collection sharply marginated. Looks like pretty uniform fluid yeah. signal intensity. Like uh, on this T2 and PD fat set coronal images. Mm -hmm. Here's the next image. Oops. There's the next image. Uh, that's the uh, the uh, that uh, uh, joint between the sesamoids. Okay, well, so a so little that, hard to see exactly what's going on. This is probably the flexor hallucis longus tendon. Uh -huh, yeah. This is probably going to be the sesamoid. The sesamoid. See, there's a separation here, and, that's a, and this communicates with that cyst that we saw. And this was a uh, flatter plate. This is a longitudinal tear uh, going along the uh, collateral ligament insertion on the uh, lateral sesamoid, as well as part of the insertion of the uh, of the muscle. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> Elior. Okay, uh, so here we have radiographs of both great toes. I see there's fragmentation of the medial sesamoid on the, the left. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't... Okay. Uh, the, I think the distance, we're judging the distances, that medial sesamoid fragment is a lot closer. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what to make of that. <laughs> so two is a lot shorter than three. Mm -hmm. So the question here, uh, this looks like a bipartite <clears throat> medial sesamoid. <clears throat> I think the symptoms were on this side. And, and this just shows that the uh, the lateral sesamoid here has been uh, is placed looks like it's placed more proximal than the, the than the medial one, and so you go to an MR scan, and this is what you see. Right. So there, right. There's a tear of that uh, sesamoid phalangeal ligament. <clears throat> right. So this is probably an avulsion fracture of the attachment of the sesamoid phalangeal ligament to the <clears throat> to the lateral sesamoid on this right side. <clears throat> and therefore the bone itself displaces proximally. Okay. And so another another form of kind of turf toe. Uh, <clears throat> Robert. All right. Um, here, let's see. Uh, looking at the, uh, again, the sesamoid phalangeal articulation, it looks like uh, there's some increased signal within the uh, plantar plate anterior. Yeah. yeah, probably this is sesamoid. This is a phalanx. This is a sesamoid phalangeal ligament. It does look like there's a lot of increased signal intensity. And there's a <clears throat> there's this thing here, <clears throat> and this was uh, found to be a distal avulsion uh, injury to the attachment of that ligament on the base of the proximal phalanx here. Uh, another form of turf toe injury. And then you can see it. And then some other injuries. So the kind of things to look for, which you see in this case, you can get sesamoid fractures, avulsion fractures, you can get phalangeal uh, sesamoid ligament avulsions, uh, and get disruptions of the uh, abductor hallucis to medial sesamoid at its attachment, and, uh, and this patient ended up having an open repair of the procedure. Okay. 
Okay, so all right, so looks like there's a disruption of the proximal aspect of the sesamoid phalangeal. Right. Uh, so it's like a complete rupture with proximal retraction of the sesamoid bone. If we go to the coronal images, we can see <clears throat> flexor hallucis longus, lateral sesamoid, medial sesamoid, yeah. and we've got a tear of the interphalangeal ligament, as well as what we saw before was a tear of the uh, sesamoid uh, phalangeal ligament. I mean, the, this is the inner sesamoid uh, ligament. And then, uh, uh, so this was another turf toe with a sesamoid abulsion. Um, so the patient had great toe, athlete with great, great toe pain. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a, a fluid in that, uh, I mean, Understand that that uh, first uh, uh, proximal interphalangeal joint a little bit. Uh, There's fluid there, but that's probably physiologic. What's going mm -hmm. on here? Uh, it's like uh, thickening. I don't know. Okay. Thickening and increasing of the lateral lateral ligament. Yeah. Okay. And then here. We can see there's a lot of uh, fluid and edema in that area. Mm -hmm. And this was a capsule ligamentous tear of that first meta meta tarsophalangeal joint. Okay. All right. Hellior. Okay. Uh, Thirty-three year old diabetic female. Inability to flex the toe. Yeah, the second toe was involved in this one. Okay. Um, it looks, is that like an, a skin ulceration? Yeah. Uh, on the yeah. plant yeah, carpet? Big, yeah, the big ulcer here. Mm -hmm. Lots of edema, the underlying soft tissues. The I'm not sure I'm seeing the flexor tendon very well. Flexor tendon there, nothing here. Hard to see it on the third, fourth, and fifth. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the Sagittal images, we can see these big uh, uh, defects in the skin. And uh, here you can see a retracted flexor tendon right here. Mm. And, uh, this is actually the flex tendon to flex back. That was at uh, the distal end of it. It was torn, should have attached down here. And this was a uh, rupture of the second flexor tendon with retraction. Okay, Robert. All right, we have third MTP pain after athletic injury, uh, and it looks like there's a uh, dorsal dislocation of that proximal phalanx relative to the metatarsal head. Right. Okay, and here's what it looks like on the coronal images. <clears throat> yeah, again, looks dislocated yeah. Yeah. and what we have here is a rupture of the uh, uh, plantar plate that level and that flexor tendon is retracted and thickened and tendonotic uh, here
Sorry, Dr. Cruz, if you're talking, I can't hear you. Thank you. Yeah, somehow the mic was turned off. Thank you for telling me that. So what we see here is then that the base of the uh, proximal phalanx is dislocated. Uh, this part of the base of the proximal phalanx should be down in this area. Mm -hmm. So we can see that there's going to be marked stretching uh, those of uh, that plantar plate. And it goes up here, so you have to be very concerned about rupture and possible then retraction of that flexor tendon. And this was a complete disruption, traumatic disruption of the plantar plate uh, in this patient with a proximal retraction of the flexor tendon. Elior. Okay, so 37 year old male with toe pain. Mm. There's on the painful side, looks like there's a edema surrounding that MTP joint. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe there's an increased separation between the flexor tendon and the proximal phalanx here. Yeah, you know, in, in the hand, we'd call this probably an A2 pulley tear. Mm -hmm. And here we can see uh, we don't have both sides here, but there may be a little bit of edema and some separation between the flexor tendon and the phalanx. And this is this was called a pulley tear. Now. There's a lot of uh, debate among anatomists as to whether there are true pulleys in the toes as opposed to the fingers where they're well documented. And there are people on both sides of the issue here. Uh, but this was probably a, a traumatic injury to the soft tissues which stabilized the flexor tendon. And whether you call them pulleys or not is a matter of which camp you're in. Okay. All right, let's go on to the anterior tendons. There's a tibialis anterior, extensor helicus longus, and extensor digitorum longus. <clears throat> if you look at the dorsum of the foot, we've got a system of retinaculum that helps stabilize these to keep, keep them close to the bones so that they uh, pull in the correct directions. And we have the medially, we have the tibialis anterior, then the extensor helicus longus, and then the extensor digitorum tendons. Now, the extensor, uh, the tibialis anterior is the most commonly injured uh, of the anterior tendons. They're still pretty uncommon to see them injured compared to other tendons. But by far, of these three, the most common is the tibialis anterior. And you can see it goes under the different retinaculum, or basically three that it goes through. And there's a tendon sheath under these retinaculums to allow the tendon to move without kind of getting impinged upon the overlying stabilizing retinaculum. And therefore, it's not uncommon to get tenosynovitis uh, with uh, repetitive trauma or overuse of the tibialis anterior tendon. And it's kind of obliquely. It's not in the straight uh, sagittal plane that we typically use. They come down and, and inserts distally, usually uh, involving the... Uh, medial uh, cuneiform. Uh, so here's the talus, uh, the navicular, and the, the medial cuneiform. Attaches here, and then you can see it go proximally and laterally up to the, close to the midline. So that's the tibialis anterior location. And <clears throat> let's see, I don't know, who's next? I think it's... So there's a... Uh... A lot of uh, tendon sheath thickening and uh, fluid, right? Okay, there's where the marker is. Here are the axial images. So, yeah, uh, pretty marked tenosynovitis would be. Right. So, there you can see there's a lot of tendinopathy yeah. within the tendon. It's enlarged, its margins are indistinct. And then we have a large amount of fluid uh, within the tendon sheath. And the tendon sheath shouldn't be this large. So this is probably a chronic condition to allow this degree of enlargement. And this is uh, anterior tibialis tenosynovitis. Okay.
Uh, so we have uh, <coughs> increased signal in thickening of the tibialis anterior tendon uh, just in front of the joint. And uh, concerning for the tear. tear okay. Uh, and this is a complete tear. It's a complete tear. So it was completely torn off its attachment to the medial cuneiform, retracted back to here, and we can see all this fraying, uh, the distal fibers of the tibialis anterior tendon. So like we've talked about elsewhere, you first you get tendinosis, you get weakening of the tendon, and then finally you get ruptures, and that's what occurred here. So that's a tibialis, anterior tibialis tendon, complete tear with retraction. Elior. <clears throat> Okay, patient fell a month ago, hit ankle on garbage can, wound stitched in the ER, now persistent pain and lump. Um, With decreased flexibility in the toes. Decreased flexibility, yes. Yeah, I think, yeah, we're looking at this anterior tibialis tendon, I think, or or maybe the digitorum tendons uh there's yeah there's some irregularity in these tendon fibers they look torn um okay here's the, the, here are the axial images right okay so these i think it's these extensor digitorum tendons that look injured there's tenosynovitis and tendinosis so the medial one is going to be the tibialis anterior. Then you okay. have the extensor flexor hallucis, and then you have the extensor digitorum. Oh, okay. And this was actually a laceration to the tibialis anterior uh, that wasn't recognized that the tibialis anterior was lacerated. Uh, so they stitched up the overlying cut without fixing the underlying uh, tendon. So this patient had to go to surgery to the OR, open everything back up again. And, and fix that tendon. Okay, uh, Robert. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. Here, the anterior tibialis tendon, I think looks okay, but the one adjacent to it, uh, maybe is a little bit thin and increased in signal. Okay. So it's coming down here and ends right there. Yep. So what is that? Uh, is that the extensor hallucis longus? Yeah. And there you can see fluid in the tendon sheath, the retracted tendon. So that was a full thickness tear of the extensor hallucis longus. <coughs> All right. All right, at the marker, uh, this is the extensor hallucis that's very amorphous at the level of the first TMT. Yeah, and there's where the symptoms are right over that. There's the PD fat set. Here are the coronal images. Uh, so there's still some tendon in there. Is this just a... Uh... Yeah. Tenosynovitis? So this was really kind of a mid-substance, high-grade oh. partial tear. Okay. That's probably some edema surrounding it. So, um, so uh, there is a yeah, edema thickening, uh, increased signal in that. Um, is it uh, extensors, uh, halicis longus tendon? Okay, so let's go here. There's one image. And then um, there's the next image. Yeah, it's the complete tear of that okay. thing. Next image. Next image. And that was the complete tear with re with a little retraction of the tendon. Cool. Elior? Okay, so... 50 year old female slipped on water, rule out extensor halicis longus tear. Um, I'm not seeing the extensor halicis longus tendon. 
So we see a little something here, but it, it's not really centered. This is the first metatarsal hit, and it should be pretty much centered in the middle here. Mm -hmm. now, this is the next cut proximally, and it looks like this. Directly put the marker right. right over it. Right, I don't... See, this I don't, is distal, I'm sorry. We're going more distal, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Right, I, I don't see the tendon there. I think it's completely torn. Yeah, and then we go distally down there. If you go to the sagittal images, this is what that area looks like. Uh, yeah. This is not here with extensor helicus longus. Okay. Yeah, so this is just that here's where the muscle originates and extends down anteriorly between the, the tibialis anterior and the digitorum and then comes down and attaches to the distal end. Uh, why don't we stop? Well, no, let's do this next case first. Robert, what do you think of this case? Uh, here it looks like there's some uh, fluid structure kind of adjacent to the uh, extensor digitorum. Right, good. So this is the tibialis anterior, flexor helicus longus. And then this, the digitorum, and there's a portion of the digitorum which is very kind of broad based. Uh, because it's basically kind of one tendon and then it divides into four tendons that go out to the different toes. And so right in through, and this is tenosynovitis of the extensor digitorum. Okay. All right. So looking at the extensor digitorum, again, looks like there's some multi-blocker fluid surrounding in the tendon right. sheath. And probably a little bit of irregularity of the tendon there and some yeah. fluid in it. And this is, again, tendinosis of the extensor digitorum. Oh, it's a very, very thickened. Uh, we've got something thickened here, right? Mm -hmm. Very thick. The black Tendon it, coming down here and you kind of lose it. It's lose, yeah. So it's complete. And here are the it's retraction. coronal images. I think this is T1 and this is a stir image. Mm -hmm. And then here. Oh. Uh, there's uh, something in, in the in the eye. Uh, it's it's uh, the. Um, uh, it's a uh, 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 chondromatosis of right. the tendon. Synaga chondromatosis All right. of the tendon. Very good. Okay. Excellent. So why don't we stop here, <laughs> and we'll take the big topic of the Achilles tendon in our next lecture. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's like Tuesday, right? No, yeah. On Tuesday, somehow. Yeah. Well, the next lecture, Black Tuesday. <laughs>